Last night, I was warning investors that Silicon Valley Bank had extremely grim prospects ahead. Then within 24 hours of that video, the FDIC seized Silicon Valley Bank for being insufficiently capitalized. They did put out a press release saying, look, if you have an insured deposit up to that $250,000 threshold, you would be covered. You get that money on Monday. The problem is there are a lot of businesses that had their money deposited with Silicon Valley Bank, things like payroll funds. And they're wondering, hey, that's well above that $250,000 threshold. When do we get our money? And if this takes weeks or even months to resolve, that could create huge ripples for businesses having to do potentially layoffs. It's, it's a huge fog of uncertainty right now, how big of an impact we will see in terms of the economy, in terms of these folks getting their money back that's well in excess of the insured deposit amount. So that's that's really the key sort of uncertainty that we're facing with Silicon Valley Bank right now is how fast it will take for them to get 100 cents on the dollar, dollar or will they not? Will they get a haircut? And when you start dealing with that uncertainty, you you know, you're talking about an extremely unfavorable event for the economy, you know, where demand pulls back significantly if this is prolonged. Then a subsequent question, I've gotten this a lot from different viewers and subscribers at my website at unravelinvesting.com. Is there another bank that we should be concerned about? Who is potentially next? In this video, I wanted to talk about Charles Schwab, Wells Fargo, and First Republic. These were you know, three of the banks that were most questioned or brought up. And so, first of all, in full disclosure, this is not financial advice. And I often call out, look, I personally keep my funds at interactive brokers. There's a reason why. Um, first of all, I like having the 4% cash that I get and link below to interactive brokers, but it's also, you're not dealing with the complexities of being a bank. You're looking at a brokerage firm. And when you look at their balance sheet, it's much, much cleaner. Sure. It's a hundred billion dollar balance sheet, but as you can see, most of the big items, it's having to do with the cash and securities owned by their customers and just making sure that they keep it separated. They keep it segregated and monitor their customers. As long as Interactive Brokers does a good job monitoring their counterparties and their customers, making sure their customers don't blow up, then you know they're doing okay. That's generally how it seems like they've done. And keep in mind, they were profitable through the great financial crisis. You know, their recent results were fantastic. So that's part of the reason why I keep my funds. I sleep well at night currently with, with my capital tied up at Interactive Brokers. Link below to Interactive if you're interested in learning more. And so when you're looking at a bank and potentially, you know, problems with a bank stock, you really need to understand there's two key aspects that drives it. So one is you have assets, and this is what happened with Silicon Valley Bank, where they effectively, you know, made a bet on long dated bonds, interest rates went up, that created problems because those long dated bonds dropped in value significantly. Now, just because your assets decline in value, doesn't necessarily mean that your bank actually gets seized or that you could be in deep, deep trouble. You could actually run an insolvent bank for years. The trick is you have to get this second component because an insolvent bank, you know, just because you have negative equity, if you're still profitable, you can work your way out of the hole where it really creates a problem is this second component. That's why you need to understand that there's sort of two steps here before you sort of crack the bank, you know, where you start seeing real problems is you not only have to have problems with their assets, you need to see problems with the deposits as well, where money starts leaving because they're nervous. And that's what you are seeing with Silicon Valley Bank, because, you know, I called out in my last video, yeah, their equity, they were effectively insolvent. And the, the folks that had their money there woke up to it like, oh, snap, you're practically insolvent, we're pulling our funds. And so when you have that two step dance, that's when you start, you know, cracking some eggs where things start breaking. Um, so let's look at Charles Schwab with this understanding that you need to see both assets and deposits, you know, really facing a challenge before, you know, you start seeing a, a type of, you know, real problem with a bank. So when you look at Charles Schwab, first of all, this is just a huge company, you know, $500 billion, you know, in terms of assets on their balance sheet, it's spread across a lot of different things. This balance sheet's a lot harder to understand than something like interactive, partly because this is a bank versus a brokerage, um, you know, sizable amounts of available for sale securities, receivables, held to maturity securities, bank loans. And when you dive in a bit, you see that their held to maturity securities includes mortgage backed securities, the same problem that Silicon Valley Bank had. And they're saying, yeah, it's worth $173 billion, but they're also acknowledging that they trade on a public market at 
billion dollars. So there's a, you know, and, and when you look at this in their first mortgages, combine these two things, there's about a $17 billion hole on Charles Schwab's balance sheet. That's not, you know, so when they, when they're, when they're accounting for their balance sheet, they use the 173 figure, but they're recognizing like, actually, if we had to sell it today, if we had to sell it today, because that two-step problem assets and depositors start pulling capital, then you'd notice, okay, there's a $17 billion hole. Now, relative to the equity in this business, and that's really the the test that you want to say is like, well, how big is the hole relative to the effectively the value of this company? You know, if, how much positive equity do you have? And so if you have a $17 billion hole versus $27 billion in equity, I don't like to see that. That's not great. You know, if you have another big hole developed, then you're in trouble. But I'm looking at this and it's not like Silicon Valley Bank. This is not where the equity was effectively wiped out. You need to see something else step in to really get you in trouble. You need to see something, another component um, that would really drive a problem, in my opinion, based on looking at this. Now, what about Wells Fargo? Wells Fargo, you know, did not have favorable news today because they reported a technical issue for customers. My, myself, I keep a small amount, you know, of, of uh, you know, everyday cash at Wells Fargo. And, uh, First of all, it's like a crime what they pay on their their savings accounts. It's like 0% versus, once again, the 4% cash that I get at Interactive, which encourages me just to move more of the cash over there, personally. Um, but Wells Fargo said, oh, yeah, we had this technical glitch, and so the deposit numbers aren't, aren't right, necessarily. And, the, oh, they're working to resolve this issue. I, you know, I'm, I'm laughing, sort of smirking about it now because it's like, dude, dude, you picked a terrible day for it to have a glitch. But in, in like all seriousness, if they don't get this under control, like you can't be a top bank and have glitches like this with your deposits. Like this is amateur hour that this is happening. So if, if they can't, you know, get this under control by Monday or Tuesday next week, really Monday next week, like I would expect serious, serious problems. Like you cannot have a major bank like, whoop, whoopsie doodle, I missed a zero. Like that, that, that doesn't fly. You know, when you have a trillion dollar balance sheet, you know, and lots of depositors looking at, you know, Wells Fargo trying to size up their balance sheet, you know, once again, two, nearly $2 trillion in assets, just an, a humongous company, way, way bigger than Schwab and Silicon Valley Bank. But they do have a hole in their balance sheet, similar to what you saw with, you know, some of these other companies that I just called out. They have a $42 billion hole um, tied to their held to maturity securities. You know, they're saying, hey, because we're going to hold it until maturity, it's worth nearly $300 billion. But if we had to sell it right now, based on where it's publicly trading, it's actually closer to $255 billion. So that is this $42 billion hole. Similar types of, you know, spread across long dated, you know, uh, bonds. Uh, it's worth calling out that, you know, so a lot of people are going to be quick to blame, let's say Jerome Powell, oh, he's raising rates and he broke it. The, you know, every time you see a, a, a hole in a balance sheet, because folks are saying, well, you know, the, 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 the bonds that we own are actually down a lot from the price that we paid. They made a choice to reach for yield. They made a choice to say, hey, I'm I'm willing to own this bond for the next 10 years. And that's not Jerome Powell's fault, in my opinion. That's their fault for reaching for yield. So every time I see a loss, I'm not saying, oh, this is central bankers fault. This is their fault for reaching. There are plenty of smart investors, Warren Buffett as an example, who said, hey, I'm not going to reach for yield. I'm just going to keep my hundred billion dollars in cash. I'm just going to sit on it. And it might not yield as much if I were to put it in 10 year paper, but I'm just going to keep it in, in cash. I'm going to keep it in overnight treasuries, that type of stuff. So I, I look at this thinking like these losses were earned with poor choices. So $42 billion hole versus $160 billion equity, a lot more breathing room than what you have with Schwab, which I think I said $17 billion hole versus $27 billion equity. So, you know, lots of equity here. You know, I uh, there would need to be something you know, that, there would, that technical problem would need to become a week-long glitch for Wells Fargo to be a real problem, to wake up and say like, oh, we've been hacked and our deposit numbers aren't right. Like that would be the, the a mega catastrophe, you know, $2 trillion bank, you know, doing that. That would be a big problem. But looking at their balance sheet now, you do not have that solvency risk that we were talking about. 
How about First Republic? First Republic was, you know, sort of guns blazing today, you know, jumping out saying, look, folks, you know, our, our stock price might have gotten hammered. And all these companies, you know, I think Wells Fargo was actually up slightly today. All of them were down over the last few days tied to this sort of in sympathy, you know, with, you know, Silicon Valley, this sort of fear of contagion. But, you know, First Republic, you know, it was down significantly along with Schwab today as well. And they, they're, you know, sort of guns blazing, like, look, technology related deposits represent only 4% of the total. That's a direct jab at Silicon Valley Bank. You know, they're talking about, look, we have this great loan portfolio that we can effectively borrow against from the Federal Reserve up to the tune of $60 billion. So we have plenty of liquidity. And they also talk about, look, our loan portfolio is really good, non-performing assets, only six basis points, so 0.06. Uh, so really, you know, they're, they're trying to say, look, we're, we're running this really well. And when you look at their balance sheet, you know, it's very clear loans is the biggest component. It's not as, you know, tricky to sort of say, well, okay, you got these debt securities held to, held to maturity, available for sale, well, really, what's going on? That said, they do have a hole you know, from some of the debt securities they have invested in. For example, in this case, it's muni mu primarily municipal securities where, you know, it costs them around $17 billion it's currently on the market for around 14, 15, or it publicly traded around that level. So they do have a, around a $5 billion hole, you know, on their balance sheet, but they do have 14 billion in equity. So it's, it's not like it's the end of the world. I mean, once again, looking at these different, you know, three, I'd say Schwab from a, you know, whole to equity, you know, measure, I would say that's probably uglier than what we saw with these other two, you know, Wells Fargo and uh, First Republic here. But in in none of these, like, let's to be like super crystal clear, none of these are anywhere near as bad as what looked like Silicon Valley Bank, where I could tell you in just a few seconds, like, yeah, you have this hole that's as much as their equity. This is a big problem, especially if depositors are waking up to it. And so as as long as like these met these these ratios stay where they are and you don't see that second component, which is a deposit base start fleeing, then I'd say you're you're probably fine. And that's that's really something to just be aware of. And that's pr partly what makes you know, all of this so tricky is that, you know, you know, the, the deposit base fluctuating, fluctuating, you know, it's very much, you know, one of my favorite movies is It's a Wonderful Life is you do get some animal spirits like where, you know, all of it takes is, you know, like a rumor and then all of a sudden you can get a run. But the reality is these banks are so huge. It would take so much to to get that de that deposit base moving in a, in a in concerning way. So I'd I would be surprised if any of these institutions get themselves to the same level that you saw with Silicon Valley Bank. I personally suspect Silicon Valley Bank isn't the only one out there. I suspect there's probably another small regional player that made a similar bet overreaching that's probably insolvent, you know, or they're, they're, the, the hole in their balance sheet's the same as, you know, their equity. But once again, it requires that two-step process where the depositors have to wake up and say, oh my gosh, I'm pulling my capital to really have a problem. And so I I look at the way things stand now. I, I don't think at, at this point, you know, the, with the data that's currently available, first of all, I, I, I don't think you have that same risk as I'm calling out, you know, as I called out with Silicon Valley Bank, like last night, I was like, this is tough. Like, I don't, I don't see how you recover. And I called it out. You could check the video. This was before effectively the stock goes to zero with with the FDIC seizing them. In order to have real problems beyond the what what happened with Silicon Valley Bank, in order to have real problems, let's say spread, I think you need to have another domino. I think you either need to have something like another bank blowing up or to have some sort of impact to the economy. Like, because you saw with Wells Fargo, you saw with First Republic, you would need to have something like where, you, where you're concerned about their loan book because the economy is getting hurt so significantly. And only in that situation do you start getting a little bit more worried that, okay, the equity might be impaired. And then you could have heightened risk of depositors pulling capital. At this point, it's it's uncertain. I mean, really, the big uncertainty is what's going to happen to the folks that have more than $250,000 with Silicon Valley Bank. And a lot of companies are coming forward. You know, I think Roku's one of them where they kept, you know, a huge amount of their cash with Silicon Valley Bank. And so they're waking up to a, a huge headache here, wondering when they're going to get it. And so that's that's going to be 
a huge uncertainty in terms of payrolls. You know, I'm personally using this environment to look for what are the opportunities of companies that I am sure will be around five to 10 years from now that will continue compounding and ideally can even benefit from this stress. So I encourage you to sort of have that long-term mindset as well. If you want to know, you know, the compelling ideas that I'm personally finding, check out unrivaledinvesting.com. And if you enjoyed this educational video, please make a point of hitting that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button. Thanks so much for watching Unrivaled Investing.